Please take it away, Zach, and I'll um, mute us so that you can have feedback. All right, we on? You hear this thing? I guess I'll 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 take quiet as as an answer that yes, we are live. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Zach Krohn. Uh, I work for Autodesk. I'm a software analyst. Um, that means that, uh, on a very general sense, what I do is I work with developers and product designers, uh, that is software developers, and I bang on Revit and a product called Vasari until it breaks, and then I give people feedback on how and why it broke and how badly it is broken and that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of what I do is I spend um, most of my time sort of inside in the guts of, of Revit and Vasari, understanding how different pieces of it work together. Today, what I'd like to talk to you guys about, sort of as, as your head in a box today, which is very disembodying, um, is about adaptive components. And this talk is called Adaptive Components from Data to Tada. What I want to do is I want to give sort of a brief overview of some of the issues involved with doing um, these particular kinds of elements in Revit and then get into some live demos of sort of more interactive work in the product itself to show you how some of the pieces go together. So if it starts off kind of abstract, stick with me for a little bit and uh, we'll try and get down to something a little bit more concrete. And come on, PowerPoint, work with me. There. So I like to start off with this picture, which is neither Revit nor Autodesk nor something that I've made, but this is a project by uh, Grimshaw Architects uh, done a few years ago as Fulton Street Station. And what it illustrates is something that I really adore about sort of BIM and parametric design in general. And what this shows is there's, uh, there's one organizing principle for this sort of large atrium space, which is you've got two arcs. I'm just sort of highlighting one in red, but uh, there's an arc, there's a center point to that arc, and there are all sorts of design details and decisions that fall out of that simple relationship between two arcs sort of coinciding with each other. And the way that they put this model together, which I believe was done in generative components, allows for late stage changes to some of the basic principles of how this thing has gone together. That is, if you decide that the volume needs to be bigger in the space, or that the center point needs to be in a different location, or that you need to move around any number of things, uh, the model is constructed such that you can make changes to some of those basic premises and have it percolate through all sorts of other aspects of the model. Now, this is a illustration of doing a, a similar idea within Revit, and this brings me to this one concept to sort of kick this off with, which I have mixed feelings about, but we're going to go with it. Uh, complex interactions without scripting. So the model here shows two different sort of views or aspects of the same model. Uh, on my left, I think it's, yes, it's also your left, is basically the abstraction of a form, a sort of a, a hallway or an arcade, and on the right is a more detailed representation of that same space as it might be roughed out with structural members. And it's controlled by a rig that is sort of three control polygons that you can adjust to make very large changes to the overall form. So then the, the structure is sort of then a byproduct of those sorts of changes. So you can make changes late in the game. And what this illustrates is this idea of being complex without being complicated, which is a, a quote I'm taking from Shane Berger, who uh, used to work for Grimshaw Architects and now works for uh, Woods Bagot, a large international firm. But uh, the, the image that it's illustrating is Waterloo Station, which is uh, a train station in London. It is a ra rather complex roof structure, and its underlying concept is quite simple. It's two arcs that sort of have a, a, a particular relationship to each other. Uh, there's sort of the tangency condition, and they move along this sort of sinuous railroad path. And what this layout for the design allowed the architects to do was to, again, make late breaking changes to the design or sort of be able to flexibly work with the design and have all sorts of other assumptions and structural systems sort of play themselves out based on that. And the way that this kind of design has historically been done has been with scripting. Uh, heavy use of um, 
some amount of manual computer coding done. Uh, a lot of people are quite facile with it. I am not. Um, I know a lot of architects are not facile with it, but it is quite robust and it is a, a tried and true method for people to do this sort of complex parametric design. Another one that is very popular these days is also visual programming. A lot of people see this in products like Grasshopper, Revit, and Vasari are starting to develop it with a, a, a work in progress. It's called Dynamo. And the basic idea with this is that you, you create uh, very explicit relationships between nodal characters in an editor, and each node represents uh, points or mathematical functions or other geometry, and you can architect certain relationships between them. And people have been using this to make all sorts of complex things from stadiums to towers to even, you know, small handheld devices using this, or controllers for Arduinos and that sort of thing. But what I want to focus on today is talking about using sketching as a method to achieve very similar results to what I'm showing in the previous slides. And the strength, I think, in showing a sketch-based method, and this is where adaptive components can really come to the foreground, uh, is that these are tools that architects have been using for since before there were architects. Uh, on the lower right hand, we've got Alberti's uh, facade to Santa Maria Novella, which was done, you know, clearly with pencils and straight edges and compasses. But I think that the thing that is interesting to me about this diagram is that it shows parametric relationships. It shows that you've got a proportional system that's defined by um, a certain sort of stepped uh, change that you can be that can be defined by arcs and lines. And on the left, we've got an ellipse, which is usually something that can be very hard to describe in terms of construction, but it can also be something that can be broken down into a series of radii. And then up in the top center, we've got the Waterloo Station again, which can be understood as a series of arced relationships. And if you can draw that sort of arced relationship, uh, I contend that you can actually create parametric relationships through sketching and without using um, graphical editors or text-based computation. So this brings me to the difference between drawing in the computer or computing in the drawing. So, oh, wait, I've got a little comment here. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Somebody's going to have to send up a flare if you can't. Um, thumbs up. Excellent. Great. Thank you. So computing the drawing or drawing in the computer. This is uh, generally how people have been using sketch-based interfaces with computers. Um, this is the basic CAD idea where you draw something in the computer and it's very much like drawing it on paper. You put your arc down and then it does not actually have any intelligence inherent in it. It is an arc and an arc is an arc is an arc and it has no relationship to anything else. And that can be fine. You can get a lot of work done that way and people have for lots of time. The other idea is sort of a top-down, again, a scripted idea of relationships in the computer. The problem that I have with this, and while it is very effective, um, this shows a piece of code that sort of spews out um, a series of points into three-dimensional space to create complex geometry. The problem with this is that as soon as you take away that piece of code, you still have a bunch of points that are just spewed out in space that don't have any necessary relationship to each other or embedded intelligence. And what I'd advocate for is more of an agent-based design. Here we've got the guys from the Matrix. And the idea with these guys, Agent Smith, is that you have many, many duplicates of the same piece of geometry, but they have an organizing principle that's embedded in each one of them. They each operate independently, but they also together make one sort of larger movement. And so the basic idea here is that we're making relationships and not stuff necessarily. And the way that this works in the Revit interface, and I'm assuming that everybody at this conference has some experience with um, the Revit platform, otherwise I'm not sure that you'd be here. Uh, but just to sort of illustrate a little bit of what's going on under the hood, you start off with a work plane and you draw a point on it. You're not just drawing a point in space. This isn't just XYZ coordinates. You've drawn a point that has a relationship to a work plane. And then if you add more points, those points also have relationships to a work plane. And then if you connect them with a line, that line has a connection to the points, to the work plane, head bone connected to the knee bone kind of thing. 
and so on. If you make points on that line, you get more relationships. And you can start building up real complexity just through what is really a drawing operation, something that is familiar to most architects. So when you're making parametric forms using a sketch-based interface, you generally need to rely on a couple of pieces of mathematical knowledge that you learned a long time ago back in high school. And I'm talking about basically like sophomore, junior year of high school. You learned about Euclidean constructions. That is you know, the shortest distance between two points is a line. Basic trig trigonometry. You know, does anybody here remember SOHCAHTOA, sine, cosine, tangent? Uh, things that you can easily look up on Wikipedia, and some basic algebra. And that between those two things, when you combine them with points and lines and planes, you can combine them also with a tiny bit of math and you can pretty much make anything. So I like to call this a geometer's approach, which is you know a compass-based, line-based, point-based, geometry-based way of setting up relationships. It's also amenable to working with a mathematical mindset. So what I'm showing here in this illustration is two different ways to derive the radius of an arc. Given that you have an arc, you can find out what the center of it is manually uh, by connecting three points on that arc and then making a midpoint perpendicular line and it will derive this point, which is its radius, always will be. But you can also mathematically derive it. And those are two different mindsets that allow you to work that way. And I think that the method that I'm going to show allows itself for both. And just one more illustration of what it is that you can do with sort of points, lines, planes, and a tiny bit of math. You can really do anything. Um, that's what the world's made out of, points, lines, and planes. So when people say that, you know, whatever software packages is, is is limiting my imagination or doesn't make the forms that I want it to. If you have points, lines, and planes, I, I don't really buy it. It may be more difficult in one thing than another, but y you can achieve all those things. And I'm going to show a couple pieces of some stuff that I have more thoroughly fleshed out on my website, which is BuildZ. That's B-U-I-L-D-Z. You can do that at buildz.info or buildz at blogspot.com. Or also, if you just do a Google search for it, it usually comes up closer to the top. So let's get down to it. Let's get into business here with the adaptive component. Um, I'm going to look at this room for a second because I want to see how many people have actually played around with an adaptive component? Can I see can I see hands? How many people have used adaptive components? Anybody? Oh, fresh minds. Lots. Okay, great. So I, I will spend some time on this then. An adaptive component is different than many or most of the families that you're going to run into in Revit in that it is not a single point placement uh, family. It can be, but it usually is not. It's helpful to think about it like a, a rubber band that is stretched between a bunch of thumbtacks. You have the thumbtacks being a placement point or number of points, and then you have relationships that you build into the family that sort of stretch and pull and move and accommodate themselves to how you're placing down those three points. And I'll put that in contrast to basically most other families in Revit in that it is not a building feature based family. For instance, when you have a railing, railings have certain superpowers. You know, they have a top and they have a bottom and they have a cut angle. They have a relationship to a railing. It's really great for making a railing and it's built around that. Similar things with things like columns. Columns have a top level and a bottom level because those are things that are important to columns. And each one of those families is really built around the idea of being optimized for a particular building feature, something that you would look up in suites, something that you would order off of a truck that is a pre-made element or is a well-defined building element. And that's great. Uh, and they work really well at that. Um, I'm sure that anybody who's been in, a, in an office using Revit for some amount of time has seen the abuse of this sort of thing. This, these are also railings, or at least they would schedule as railings in Revit. On the left, we've got uh, a louvering system, which was designed using railings because it has repeated elements, and railings are very good at making repeated elements. If you want to change one aspect of it, it'll percolate through it. But that louver is going to show up as a railing. 
On the right, we've got Phil Reed's famous monorail, also done as a railing, uh, which I adore, but it is, it is such an amazing hack. Um, the adaptive component really starts off as an abstracted geometry feature. Uh, the, the category that it comes in out of the box is generic model. Um, it, it doesn't pretend to be anything that it isn't unless you explicitly make it so. You can set its category to be things that are within the architectural realm like furniture um, and, and a, a handful of other categories that are available to it. But it is an abstract feature. You can use it to make things like a spiral staircase on the left or uh, on the bottom I've got a structural system that's made out of frames or something like on the bottom right the uh, my version of the roof to the Waterloo station or say you need to make a paramecium up on the upper right we've got that too and I just want to open up an actual file to give you a taste of what this tool can be assembled into uh, once you get a moderate amount of complexity into your components. So what I'm going to do is we're going to dissect this model a little bit and then I'm going to get into some of the tools and concepts that you would need in order to make something like this yourself. So I'm going to turn off shadows just for performance issues. But um, here I've got uh, sort of another roof structure. It's glass. It's got mullions. It starts to have an ar architectural aspect. You could do renderings with this sort of thing. But it also is made out, again, of components, which I can, you know, I can turn them on or off. I can reduce it back to a more sort of point-based system, or I can just look at it sort of as an abstracted form like this. Um, and one of the things that I want to illustrate about this guy is that uh, I'm, use, I'm going to use adaptive components to do a couple of operations on this form that are useful as you develop a design. So if I tab in, I can see that I've got uh, what is essentially an adaptive component. It's coming up as a um, category curtain panel because there are certain categories that are available to you with the adaptive component. What I can also do is I can substitute out this family for another family. And I'm just putting in um, a panel that I call the deflection panel. And what this panel does is something entirely outside of geometry production. What I've done is I've substituted this with a panel that's actually giving me analytic information about my model. If I select one of these panels now, you can see that it's got a series of dimensional properties. It has the standard area calculation that you can get from uh, curtain panels and that sort of thing. But it also has a customized length and length 2 measurement in here. And it also has something called midpoint deflection. So what this panel is doing is it's telling me how far out of plane this particular panel is. That is, if I'm going to make this out of glass, I need to accommodate the idea that this is not a planar piece of material. Which if I go to my contractor and say, oh yeah, and I've got this great curtain system in, oh, by the way, all the pieces of glass are not flat. They're going to say, take a hike, or here, that's just fine. You're just going to need to pay an awful lot of money to get it. So how can I use this sort of analytical property to start changing this design to actually make it more affordable? So just to continue examining this model, you can see that it is actually made out of, I'm going to delete down to um, this level of looking at the form underneath it. I've got this form underneath it, and this form is actually defined by a series of ribs. Each one of these ribs is actually an adaptive component family. I can open it up for edit, and I can see that I've got a parabolic arc. And that parabolic arc is constrained such that if I, you know, it's always going to be the same proportion. So I'm building in some amount of parametric relationships into essentially my sketch here. And it's all built on top of this point. And this point is my adaptive point. So if you think back to those rubber bands that I was showing you before in the thumbtacks, that's my thumbtack. And then all these guys are my rubber bands. So this is a one-point adaptive component, but I'm going to use it to illustrate something. So if I'm looking at this guy, you can see that all of my arcs are laid out nicely here. And they are all, in turn, hosted on top of these points. And if I move my point, you can see that I get movement out of my arcs, right? 
Now, because my form is made out of an intelligent component, I can make this intelligent component do different things. I can take this point, and I can change how it's going to orient in the project. And we're going to get into this too, but I'm just going to show you sort of the power of a simple change to this, where I'm going to make this point orient itself differently when I load it back in. And I just want to go back to my analytic surface here. So I just changed this point so that it is going to point north, south, east, west rather than in any old direction when it's in the project. So if I load it into the project, I'm going to overwrite my existing condition. And we're going to see this form just alter a little bit. And it's going to percolate through. And the reason that it's taking a little while is that it also has to update all of these panels. So you can see we just had a small change in this surface. And I can control Z back to where we were. This is before and this is after. Now what happened? What happened is that I made all of these ribs straighten out. So now they're not, they are following that line but they're still orienting north, south, east, west. And that has big implications to how my panels become parameterized. Now I'm going to select this guy and I'm going to see that my midpoint deflection measurement is zero. And if I select this guy, we're going to see that it's zero also. And if I select all of them, they're in fact all zero. So by making a small change to an intelligent agent, essentially, that is being used to create form, I can suddenly make this maybe not wildly affordable, but a hell of a lot more affordable than it was two seconds ago. And I can verify it with the intelligence that's built into my component. So. How do we get there? An excellent question. So there's a series of ways that you can make these adaptive components that you can make model elements that respond to context. And by responding to context, I mean they will respond to the environment that you put them in in, a, in controllable and predictable ways. And I'm going to run through four different examples of this. Point orientation, um, controllers, something called a reactor and a transformer. If you want more information on anything that you see here, by the way, this stuff is all actually in the blog. Um, this stuff in particular is under the parametric pattern section, which is a lead part on the blog. So point orientation. Imagine this first problem. You're making an adaptive component, which is this guy. It's got four points, one, two, three, four, and it's a nice truss. It stands up nice and straight in my family. And the first time I put it down on a form, it stands up nice and straight and it looks great. I put it on other aspects of my design and it crumples and it does other things. This is actually entirely logical and I'm going to show you why and I'm going to show you how points behave in a way that is both rigorously logical and sometimes frustrating. Um, because this is a point-based family, it's very important to understand something called point orientation. And what I get a lot of questions about with adaptive components is, why is my component not standing up? And it's important to ask, what is up? Um, are you talking about gravity or are you talking about a z-axis on an xyz coordinate plane? Are you talking about a local up or a global up? That is something up as related to your surface or up as related to the planet. And these all have implications and there are, is uh, a very straightforward way to control this. And so what I want to do is uh, I'm going to open up an example family that I've got. New. And that illustrates this. And again, I'm going to put a recording of this, assuming that I don't totally crash and burn at some point, so that you can inspect these families on your own. So what I've got here is I have, this is another one point adaptive component right here. And it's a, it's a diagnostic tool that I made to understand how points orient. And if I open this guy up, I can open it for edit. <coughs> What I've got is, I have, again, just one simple adaptive component. And it has three points hosted on it. And each one of those points is hosted on the work plane of this point. So every point has three work planes. And if I load it into my project, 
I can place it down and it seems like it makes a lot of sense. I just put it down on level one and there it is just standing up as I expect it to. However, if I place it over on other aspects of the model, I'm going to see it do all sorts of different things. Here it sticks out uh, to one side. Here if I put it on a line, it sticks out to another. And this can be kind of confusing. But what it's illustrating is that um, it's inheriting its idea of up from whatever the context is that it's put on. So here I'm putting it on this surface and that surface is saying that up is pointed out in this direction. Well, I can say, well, that's all well and good that up is in that direction relative to whoever I've hosted it on, but I want it up relative to gravity because that's the world that I'm going to work in. If I select that point, I can go over and I can look like anything else in Revit. It's got a whole bunch of properties. And the property for this adaptive point that I'm interested in is orientation because I want to control how it's oriented. Right now it's by host reference. That means it's going to take its idea of up from whatever I put it on. That means that I can also override it and I can make it point something else. So I can change it to vertical on placement. That is, I want this point, no matter what I do, to always be vertical. So if I load that back into the project, I'm going to overwrite my existing uh, stuff and suddenly we see everything stick up. So I'm going to just control Z that just so you can sort of see before and after. So here we have uh, deriving up from whatever the local coordinate system is and up derived from I want to be vertical relative to gravity. I want to be vertical always. They're not all still sticking in the same direction. It's deriving it vertical, but it's still getting other information from the rest of the context that is put in. So <clears throat> if I take this guy, which is in fact hosted on a circle, it's still going to be creating some tangency relationship to a circle because it's going to get some of its information from the circle but some of its information from vertical. Well, let's say that I don't want this family to be following any aspect of this circle other than being hosted on it, having that one point hosted on it. Well, we have a control for that too. So if I select that point, I can change from vertical on placement to orthogonal on placement. Orthogonal on placement means that no matter what, I'm going to have be pointed front, right, and, and top. I would say north, south, east, west, but it, it's, it's project level. So if I overwrite everything here, we can now see that everything is in fact pointed in the same direction. All of these guys are now in lockstep with each other in terms of their orientation. They start at different places in the model, but they will all remain oriented in this direction. So again, really depends on what it is that you're trying to accomplish, but point orientation sort of lies at the heart of a lot of what you might do with adaptive components. There. Shoot. Where was I? Point orientation. All right. Next, I want to talk about a concept called a controller. And this is, again, sort of previous to talking about adaptive components in particular. This is the idea of that you can have a model that has abstracted a piece of geometry out from itself and you use that to control it. This is a little video, I don't know how this is playing back over GoToMeeting, but I've essentially got a, a graphic equalizer here. Say I've got a bunch of columns over here in green and then I have a control rig. And what I've done is I've taken some parameters over here and I've hooked them up to this guy over here to basically abstract out my geometry into a series of relationships that I think are important. And I'm actually going to open up that file because uh, I like this one. It's kind of fun. And again, all these families are going to be up on the site so you can dissect them and use them for your own evil purposes. <clears throat> and that is, let's see, controller equalizer. All right, so here's that family again. And what we can see is that for each one of these guys, this is a column or it's columnar geometry, I should say. 
and it has an offset parameter. And that offset parameter is controlled by E. I've just given it the parameter E. And E has been related to E1, which is over here. So if I open up my properties, and again, this might be tiny for you, so I apologize, but here's E, which controls this column. And here's E1, which is half of E. So whenever this point moves, it's going to move that guy. But I'm not even moving that point. I'm moving this point, right? So when I move that guy, how come that guy's moving with it? All right, let's build this guy up from scratch. I'm going to take a line, and this is going to be my controller. I'm going to start off with my controller. I'm going to draw it on level one. And I'm going to draw a circle over here. It's also on level one. And this isn't going to be quite the same thing, but I'm just going to show you the concept of a controller. So, whoops. I think I did that as a filled circle. I don't want it to. Oh, by the way, you know, I forgot to mention it, but I'm doing all this stuff in Vasari, but all of the same stuff is exactly the same in Revit. Um, so if I select this measurement, I can add a parameter, and I'll just call it ASDF. Well, no, I'll give it something sensible. Radius. Okay. And then I'm going to take a point, and I'm going to put my point on my line, like so. Now, if I select that point, I can see that it is hosted on this line. If I move this line, it'll move with it. Sort of standard behavior, right? I can also set a parameter to that, line, to that point. Right now, it's parameterized at a value between 1 and 0. Uh, I can change it to be parameterized by its length. Now it's at 41 feet as measured from the start of the line lines have a start and an end. And I'm just going to take that parameter and I'm going to I'm going to name it. I'm going to call it controller. Right? So I can still move this guy, no problem. Doesn't mean anything. It has no relationship to this guy over here. But I can make them related. So if I go to my controller and my radius parameters, whoops. Radius parameter, controller parameter. I can make radius, uh, let's call it radius uh, controller times 2, which means that, oops, oh, I didn't spell it right, controller right. So now my radius is always going to be twice of whatever this measurement is. So if I move this guy, I get bigger, I get smaller, depending on where I drag it to, like that. Now, one last piece of how this worked before, I'm going to move this guy over just so it's easier to see, was that I had another set of lines that were creating that relationship. So there's one other little trick in the bag here that I want to show, which is something called host by intersection. So I just drew a line over that other line, right? And what I want to do is I want to make like a big lever, like a big sort of steampunk way to control this. So I'm going to select that point. And that point has an option of being hosted by an intersection. If I click that, what it says is, I know I'm already hosted on this line, but now you're saying that I can be also hosted on another line. And if I click that line, it snaps to it. And it's not is very different than a line. It's not an alignment as you would normally have it in in Revit. What it is is actually a hosting relationship. So that if I pull this guy back and forth, that point is always going to stay aligned between those two points. And the reason I'm spending so much time showing these sort of basic geometric relationships is that if you think back to that Alberti facade, that's all that those proportional systems are built on, are these sort of geometric relationships of saying, I think it is important that we always have a stable relationship between the intersection of two things. Making that relationship in the standard family error uh, editor is usually pretty difficult, but in something like the adaptive component in the masking families, you can do it 
quite readily. All right, I'm covering probably too much territory here, but um, I'm going to keep moving along here. Uh, we're going to get into the actual construction now of an adaptive component now that we've looked at controller. And I want to look at something called a reactor. What a reactor is, is a set of relationships that are premised on the idea that I want an element or a series of elements to make a change to themselves based on their proximity to something else. That is, you know, as soon as I get closer to the door, I want the door to open for me. Or as soon as, you know, piece A gets closer to piece B, I want piece B to get larger. And this actually starts to encapsulate a couple of the ideas that we were just looking at, which is uh, setting up relationships between two distinct things, but it adds the idea of being able to uh, adjust and regulate based on some amount of information that goes into it. So we're going to actually build one of these things from scratch. And this is going to be the first time that I'm going to show just opening up an actual adaptive component or making one from scratch. So if I go to new, and this is in Vasari, um, if you open it up in Vasari, the new families, you have an adaptive component, you have curtain panel, Oh God, this is such a tongue twister. Curtain panel pattern based and a mass. All of these have very similar tools. Uh, if you open up in Revit for regular families, um, I don't know why this is taking so long just to find my Revit families. Oh, don't be crashing. Not in front of a room full of expectant faces. Oh, there we go. If you do a new family and you're looking to make some adaptive components, you're going to look in your regular family templates for generic model adaptive. You can get very similar behaviors with generic model pattern based and with curtain panel pattern based. I'm not going to get as much into those today, but um, just going back for a second to um, the ones that I was looking at, uh, which is new adaptive component. I'm going to make one of these intelligent components that does cool stuff how you want it to. So I'm in my adaptive component family. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make two points, one and two. And these points I'm going to designate as being special. These are going to be points that are going to be placement points. I'm going to load this into a project, and then I'm going to use these guys to position my family. If I select them, I can say make adaptive. And now I have points one and two, pleasantly labeled. So when I place the first one, it'll be this guy. The second one will be that one. I can take those two lines, uh, those two points, and I can connect them with a line. Here, I'll just do a spline through points. And again, just sort of a super dumb way to show what this does. If I go new family, I'm going to just make a, a mass to host this guy in. I'm going to take my new family, and I'm going to load it into the project. And at first blush, it doesn't do anything particularly interesting. It's just this line. But it is a family, and families, as we know, have certain superpowers. So let's start building some intelligence into this guy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to have a target, and I want to have a goal. And I want my goal element over here to change as it has a different relationship to this point over here. So I'm going to give a piece of geometry over here that I can make change. So I'm going to make a circle, and I'm going to set the work plane of it to be a work plane of this point, like that. So no great shakes here. Um, if I select that point, I can see that it's it it moves the the circle moves with it. I can take that circle, and like I said, I want to make this have some reaction to it. So I want this radius to change. So I'm going to take this radius, and I'm going to name it something. I'm going to call it radius. And I'm going to be an instance parameter, because I'm going to want it to change every time I place it in the end. And then I want to define a relationship between these two points, so that they can say, how far away am I from this point? So I'm actually going to turn this guy into a reference line. Well, am I going to do that? Yeah, well, no. I actually don't even need to do that. I'm going to just add a relationship between these points. And I want to make sure that I'm drawing on the right plane. So I'm going from my adaptive point 
to another adaptive point over here and I'm saying this relationship between these two is important. I'm going to add a parameter. I'm going to call this distance because that's what it's measuring. Every time I place this thing, I'm going to go one, two, and so that distance between them is going to be different every time I place it. So I'm going to make it an instance parameter because it's different every time. I'm also going to make it a very special kind of parameter called the reporting parameter. And what this means is that this parameter is not itself driven by anything other than whatever it's measuring. That is, whenever I move this line, this distance is going to be measured out and it's going to report out to the project, I am now 62 feet long. Well, I'm going to take that 62 feet long and I'm going to plug it back into this radius. I'm going to say that radius is dependent on distance, that it is distance divided by 10, let's say. So now, every time I change one of these points, that means that my circle is going to change too, right? So now I have a reaction. This circle is reacting to the proximity to this point. Well, that's all well and good when I do it once. I could have done that a whole lot easier just by drawing it myself. But if I want to do it a bunch of times, then I'm going to need these sort of special family pr properties. So you can see that each time I placed it, I have a different size circle. Well, the real fun comes when you can do this a lot of times and start making stuff with it. So I'm going to make a surface here like that and I'm going to divide it. And again, there's there's like hours of talk about anything in, in a lot of these different tools. Divided surface is its own thing. But I want to make a point about how you can make adaptive components sort of do tricks and giggles and stuff so that you can, you know, astound and amaze your neighbors. So I'm going to turn on nodes. So if you didn't catch that, I selected my divided surface and I changed the surface representation to nodes. The reason I did that is that adaptive components really love nodes. They like to be hosted on them. And they also, actually I'm also going to put a point out here. If I take out my family now, I can host it on a point here and I can host it on a point here. And you can see that this circle has a certain size. I could do that again. I can put it over here and it's bigger, right? Well, the fun comes when you actually do that a whole bunch of times. Say so I take this line and I move it closer, I get the circle smaller, I get the circle bigger. If I select this adaptive component, I can place it all over this thing. I can do it manually, but that's a drag. 2013 has this feature called uh, repeat, which is essentially a variation of arraying, but it's a very intelligent way to array. If I select my adaptive component and I hit repeat, it's going to take this relationship and repeat it all over these points. And it's going to take a little while, and I probably should have made the grid a little bit smaller, which I will in a second. Um, because when it's doing all of this thinking, it tends to slow down a little bit. But what we can see now is that I've got many, many instances of this circle placed along this surface. And every one of them is different. And every one of them has changed based on its proximity to this point. So let me just slim this down a little bit just for the sake of speeding things up. If I tab select back into my divided surface, eh. good old Revit selection. If I'm selecting my divided surface, I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller for the sake of reactivity. I just changed it to an 8x8 eight eight grid, which just makes a whole lot less of pieces to regenerate. So if I take this point, now I've got an intelligent relationship between this point and all these guys over here. So if I take this guy and I stretch him over, put him right in the middle, you're going to start to see some dramatic differences between each one of these instances. And come on, bam. There. So now I've got all these different guys. They're having some intelligent reaction to their proximity to that point. I'm going to try and pick it up here a little bit to get to the end and then maybe we can get some questions. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about data abstraction and extraction. Reporting parameters and adaptive components can be used to generate variations in geometry like I just showed with that reactor family where I've got 
a relationship set up and just make different kinds of geometry based on that relationship. But you can also turn it into tabular data, you can turn it into colors, you can turn it into things that analyze your model and get information back out of it. Like I was showing initially with those panels that were telling me how deformed each one of my, uh, my glass panels was going to be. And I want to just delve into reporting parameters and how they work with adaptive components a little bit more and hopefully get to some questions. Um, this is a panel that I made and has actually been used in practice by a, a few architects, at least so far. Um, this is a project by Beck Architects where they're using this basic piece of geometry and just a couple of relationships to start understanding uh, a, a design that they are in the conceptual design phases for. So they made this very nice sort of swoopy thing within what's otherwise a rectangular building. <clears throat> and they wanted to do a reality check, you know, how weird are these panels and how much are they going to break the bank if we use them this way. So they made a little panel that was going to measure how far out of deflection or how far out of plane each one of those things was just to sort of get a reality check. And the guy who did this, um, Aaron Mailer over at Beck, says that one of his colleagues came up to him and said, why are you doing this? This is why we have our engineers because they will go in and they'll do the cost estimating on it later. And his response was really interesting. He was saying that he wants to make sure that they're work remains relevant to the design process. That is, they're not just being stylists. They're not just making a nice swoopy form. They want to do some responsible work and make sure that at the outset they're doing something that, you know, can be built by human beings on this planet. And by doing a little bit of upfront work, uh, it's not something that is going to remove the need to have structural engineers or cost estimators involved in it. But it allows the architect to sort of at an earlier on part of the process when they can actually have some effect to make some effective changes and some effective decisions so that they don't look like idiots when they go and talk to the contractors. So I'm actually just going to show how that panel can be made and I'm going to return to that other model that we started off with, this guy over here. So if I make a new family that is, now I'm going to do a curtain panel pattern based, which is again another sort of variation on an adaptive component. It's got four points this time. They're pre-baked in here. They have a little bit of a special superpower like columns and railings and all that in that they have a way of embedding themselves in divided surface. I'm afraid that we don't really have the time to get into that, but what I want to show is how to use reporting parameters to now mine your model for more information. What is deflection is the question that I start off with when I want to make this panel. I want to make a panel that tells me how deflected, or how out of plane my project is, or every piece of my project is. And what deflection is, is it's a measurement of how far these guys are from here. And <clears throat> if I can measure it, I can quantify it, and I can tell my contractor all of these panels are absolutely flat, or they are one thirty-second of an inch out of plane and maybe the panelizing system that I'm using can take up that and it has a tolerance for that. So I want to measure that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a geometric relationship. I'm going to connect these points and these points by a spline by points, as we've seen before, right? Now I need to measure the distance between these two guys in order to get an idea of how far deflected out of plane I am. But I need to measure it at a particular place. I need to measure from the intersection of a perpendicular space between these two lines. So we're going to get back to the things that we were talking about before with host by intersection. If I take my point here and a point here, and just to show this a little bit better, you can see when I select it, I get um, a perpendicular work plane to this line. I'm going to make those just show up because it's nice to see. So over here in my properties, I'm in the graphical properties of these points, I'm going to always show my reference planes. And now I want them to have a particular relationship to each other. So I'm going to select my point, and as we did before, I'm going to host it by intersection. And I'm going to select that line. And now it snaps so that those guys are always lined up, like so. And I can do that with this guy too. So I'm going to host that by intersection over here. 
So now, no matter what I do with these guys, they're going to have a very tight relationship to each other, and one that happens to also be the relationship that I want to measure. So if I take my Align Dimension tool, and I put it on the work plane of this point, I can now make a measurement between that line and this line. And that is my deflection, right? So once I have that deflection, I need it. I need to name it so that I can use it later on. If I name it, I'll call it deflection. And because it's a rep it happens, it's different every time I make it. I'm going to make it a reporting parameter. So every time this guy gets placed, it's going to tell me how deflected it is. <clears throat> now, I'm just going to open up that more complex piece of geometry that we were looking at before and recall how I had I'll do this from scratch here I'm going to delete that surface I'm going to select it I'm going to divide it and I'm going to make it a little bit denser in its division let's make it 8 by 8 just so it regenerates a little faster well I've got this deformation panel in it which is almost identical to the thing that I just made. Um, it has two other measurements. It has a, a length measurement. But this is, in other ways, entirely identical to just what, what I just showed, how you can make it from scratch. If I take this surface, I can load into it any kind of panel I want. I can do mullions, I can do all this and that. But I want to actually load into it my deflection panel. If I load my deflection panel into it, every time that panel gets placed on this surface, it's going to tell me information about this particular quadrilateral panel. And as we were showing before, if I select it, it will tell me that this is in fact deformed. It's not totally flat. It may be flat enough for my contractor, or it might be flat enough for my fabrication needs, but maybe it isn't. If I go into this guy, let's see, you know, this one's three inches out of plane. I doubt my piece of glass can flex that much to fit in there. So what do I do about it once I have this piece of information mined out? Well, that is where we get our orientation parameters coming in again. And that's just to return to where we started. If I edit that profile, those ribs, I can select that point and I can make certain changes to how it orients in its host orthogonal on placement. So now all of these guys are going to point the same direction. I'm going to load it into my project building test. And so now I've got my reporting parameters working hand in hand with my orientation parameters to allow me to start doing initial stages of design where I can actually do intelligent work that gives me something that's more buildable in the end. Only got a few minutes left. Um, there's lots of other things to talk about this, but I want to just sort of blow through this and then see if we have some time for a couple of questions. So where this is all going is that I want to make a distinction about drawing in the computer or computing in the drawing. These families that I've showed a little bit about how you can author them are about how you essentially start creating complex relationships at the level of your families. And that these families, when you use them with each other, in workflows, you can actually start making very rich models that you can mine data out of later on. Um, there's a lot of applications for this. Um, this is a form that I made that reads out how much it's pointing up, down, north, east, south, and west, and changes its color and how big the aperture is. The basic idea with this is that if I'm facing south and up, I want to have a teeny tiny window to slow down on solar gain. If I'm facing down and to the north, I'd probably like to open up my windows a lot more to have more sun exposure. And this is using the same principles of orientation and reporting that we just covered. Uh, here's one where each one of these panels reads itself out on a surface, and then it redraws itself somewhere else flat. The idea here is that this is a um, sort of a prefabrication workflow where you can start to understand how do my panels, how do you cut them out? How do you actually assemble this? And lastly, this is a form that 
measures itself and reports out how many of these panels are similar to each other. So the orange ones are essentially mirror images of each other. Uh, the blue ones are all the same uh, angle condition and the same length. And this allows me to start to understand that this form, although it's very complex, is made out of only a handful of really dissimilar pieces. So I can start economizing by only making a handful of different panels to cover many, many different places. Um, there's a lot more information on any of these topics if you're interested in it on my website, which I hope to organize a bit better over the coming month. But um, the families that I showed here, I'm going to do a post on them over the weekend or probably Monday. Um, so you can actually download the families that you saw here today and play around with them yourself. But in the meantime, you can check out most of the stuff that I talked about today in the parametric design pattern section. This is um, reproducing a bunch of work that was done by a guy named Robert Woodbury uh, in other parametric design packages. Um, Generative components is one, and uh, Rhino Grasshopper is another. I'm sort of recapitulating a bunch of his ideas in here. Um, and that's about it. Uh, what I just illustrated is, in some ways, I, I used to call this an experiment in methods of how to do design, uh, parametric design. It's not so experimental anymore. Uh, there's uh, quite a few offices that are actually using these methods right now to build more intelligent. Uh, families that tell them a lot more about their design or do more things. It's an alternative to visual programming and scripting. It can also work hand in hand with visual programming and scripting. Uh, and it's basically it's a sketch based entry point to doing something that I think is generally referred to as computational design or rule based design. And it's extensible. You can use it for many different scales of design and many different scales of project. And there's more info on this on Build Z.